morning, gentlemen. We'll start a minute early so we can quit a late uh, a minute later to make up for it. Okay, good to see you all of you this morning. I don't think we have anybody here. Brother Bill wants to have something to share with us this morning here. I asked Bill to give me two minutes this morning because I came right across a, a little story this week and I think everybody can benefit from it. A priest and a rabbi met on a train traveling from Chicago to New York overnight and they had dinner together and they exchanged a few ideas about their different theological theories and everything and they agreed to meet for breakfast the next morning. The next morning the priest walks out and the rabbi walks into the dining car and there a priest is sitting there having breakfast and he's got this big plate of ham and eggs. <laughs> and he told the, the, the rabbi, he said, Rabbi, he said, you really got to try these ham and eggs. He says, they're really good. And a rabbi, knowing that this priest knew all along that he didn't eat pork, he says, no, he says, the tenets of my religion won't let me eat pork. He says, so I'll have my regular breakfast. And he says, well, he says, I, I wish you would try it. He said, but you really enjoy it. So he had his bagel and locks and they're sitting there. And that preacher reaches over to the priest and he says, I suppose uh, your wife is going to meet you at the station? And the, rap, and the priest says, well, you know, he says, the tenets of my religion will not allow me to be married. <laughs> and he says, oh, he says, that's a shame. He said, well, I'll tell you one thing, though. He says, it really beats ham and eggs. <laughs> ago I got up here and I told you at 89 years old I was thinking about getting married. Let me tell you gents, I got married this past Monday at 89 years of age. And it still beats ham and it. Anyone want to try to beat that? Anyone like to share anything with us? Any words of wisdom? I think Bill covered them all. <laughs> okay, okay. Hearing none, I'll call on Brother Dale. Where's Brother Dale? Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, let's open for our Heavenly Father. We thank you for the opportunity to come in your name and to share your word and to um, speak to my brothers. And Lord, I ask for your guidance and direction. I ask for your peace. And Lord, I ask that each one of us here this morning might be um, drawn closer to you and, and see you all and, and understand you a little more fully. In Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So I've entitled my little talk this morning, My Life in Christ, and uh, I don't know if I'll get done with it this morning, but if I don't get done with it this morning, we'll just carry on the next time I'm up here. Um, I got a, a few scriptures, and we're going to look at the Ephesians 1, 3 through 5, and then right after that we're going to look at Ephesians 2, 10. Uh, so Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Got that? We are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. All right. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Now, before the creation of the world, he knew your name. And I know I'm speaking, you know, preaching to the choir or whatever, but sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Before the creation of the world, he knew who you were and he planned a work for you to do. And he called you. He predestined you. And you think, well, I don't believe in predestination. And I don't either. But you see, um, he didn't say, okay, this one will accept Christ as Savior. He didn't say, this one I'm going to make uh, accept Christ as Savior. And this one I'm going to make go to hell. No, he predestined everybody to be called to live a holy life. I mean, it's up to us to accept that 
predestination. Now, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a father and we have children and so forth. And my desire for my children is to prosper and to be, um, you know, good citizens and, and things like that. Do, do our children always follow what we predestined them, what we have decided ahead of time? All right. And so it is with us. We don't always follow God's direction and his calling on our life. Now, once you've accepted God's predestination, his, his desire for your life, then let's look over here at Ephesians 2.10. It says, for we, are God, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, if we have works, if God has prepared something for us in advance to do, then we ought to be doing them. And, you know, sometimes I know people go through life trying to figure out what that is. And, and the whole time they're doing that, they're actually doing the work that God has designed for them to do. And I know there are people that are encouragers and you think, well, they don't really have an upfront part or anything like that. But encouragement is a huge thing. And we think about Barnabas and so forth. And everybody, God, God desired, planned for you to, to serve him in some way, some form. So, um, I, I thought that, you know, everybody's um, testimony, to me, is extremely um, interesting. Because he calls all of us, and he calls all of us in a different way, for a different walk, and so forth. So, um, I'm going to share... As far as I get this morning, I'm going to share my life in Christ. Um, I remember my earliest childhood. Um, in, we, when I grew up on, well, I didn't grow up on Spring Street. Um, but Spring Street's where we started out. And there was, uh, there's two little houses up there. Um, anybody remember where the um, Racy's lived? Yeah. All right. We lived right, the house right next to them. And uh, there was another house right there that they were both the same. I, my aunt, uh, my great aunt, uh, Ruth uh, Face, lived there. But we, we had a small house, and there was three of us before um, that other. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right, but, but I remember going into the on Sunday morning, my parents, uh, my mom, would, would dress us up, and we'd go into the kitchen, and she'd line us up against the wall. I don't know why, but she'd line us up against the wall and finish fixing up for whatever we were. And, and I remember her saying, there's my little preacher. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, now listen. Our words are so powerful, Amen. brothers Amen. and sisters. They're so powerful. Well, you still have children, you know, Young children or not, I don't see anybody here with should have young children. But, um, brother? No. Uh, <laughs> we think about everything. Uh, no, you know, but if, if grandchildren, and again, we all come in contact with people, and our words are very powerful. And my mother's words are very powerful for me. And so later in life, when I did it, then become a pastor, he, she, I, I reminded her of that. And she kind of looked at me with a blank stare. She says, well, I never meant I wanted you to become a preacher. <laughs> I just meant you look like a miniature preacher. And I thought, if I had just known that. <laughs> All right, but uh, anyway, um, our, our words are very powerful. And her words um, always stuck with me and still stick with me. Uh, and, and not just those words, but, but many others. So I, I, I preached my first sermon at age five. Uh, and I remember it very vividly. Um, I, we were in that Spring Street house, and I had, you know, my two uh, older, my, I have an older sister that's, um, I don't know, but anyway, she's older than I am, and my, my older brother, who's passed on. Um, went to be with the Lord. Um, they were on my mom and dad's bed up the headboard, and I, I don't know what it was, but I climbed up on something at the foot of the bed, and I said, God died for, for our sins. Now, that's a good sermon. Now, you know, I didn't have all the specifics right or whatever, but, you know, that was my, and I don't, again, I don't know why I remember that, but uh, my mom also remembered that, and she wrote down, um, you know, I, I don't even remember her being around, but you know how 
parents are, you know, they're always in the shadows. They, they know, you know, they got ears and eyes, places we don't, we don't have and so forth. Um, but that was, that was my first sermon. And, you know, as children, a lot of, a lot of kids will play house or they'll play school or whatever like that. Well, I grew up in a house where we played church. And, and so this was normal for us because church was such a um, intricate part of our lives that we played church. Now, we played school and, and house and things like that, too. But um, church is one of those things we played. Uh, so I accepted Christ at about age 8 or between 8 and 9. Uh, I don't exactly know which, which, um, how old I was. But I remember uh, we were having pre-Easter services at Valley Pike, and we always had revival, spring revival, fall revival, and pre-Easter services. And the pastor was pre preaching there, and, um, you know, I was just uh, lollygagging and daydreaming like I always did in church and so forth. And then all of a sudden, something hit me. It's like, you need to go up. And it's like, I didn't quite know why I needed to go up, but, you know, I needed to go up. And being the obedient child that I was, <laughs> see, both my parents are dead, so I can, uh, they're, they're probably wringing their hands and head right now. No, uh, no, but I was. I was I was basically an obedient child. Now, that's not saying I was a perfect child, but I wanted to get, you know, my parents' approval, my, you know. And so that evening when mom was tucking me in the bed, I said, I want to go forward. And she goes, well, why do you want to do that? I said, well, I, God is, you know, I, I just feel like I need to go forward. And so she explained to me, you know, salvation. And, um, and she says, I guess it'll be, you know, it'll be okay if you go forward tomorrow evening. And uh, I began to cry. And I said, Mom, what's wrong? I said, I'm, I'm as happy as I, I can be. She says, oh, son, she said, those are tears of joy. And so that was my first experience of uh, crying tears of joy. And my second experience, I guess, was, uh, I don't know, do any of you remember uh, my dad's brother, Ralph Bowers? Okay. He, you know, he was, he was one of my favorite uncles. And uh, he came to Christ when I was about 16 or 17. And that was when um, I prayed, um, I cried my second tears of joy, and here we are this morning. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, um, the next evening, <clears throat> excuse me, the next evening I was sitting there, and I couldn't wait for the hymn to start. And I'm telling you what, that, that bananas had not hit those tunes. And I was up, and I was to the front, you know, and my mom was, she was the uh, song leader at that time, and she broke down, and she couldn't leave the singing, you know, and uh, from that time on, on, I was a different person. Now, does that say I was a perfect person? Absolutely not. Does it say I did everything I was supposed to do, what God had planned out for me to do? Absolutely not. And I'm sorry to say I didn't, but we get too soon old, too late, smart. So or wise or whatever, uh, but we always had at our home. We always had family worship. All right, in the morning, we always had family worship. I don't care if the world came to an end, we had family worship. I don't care what it was. You could miss breakfast. You can miss school. You can miss anything. But we were not going to miss family worship. Uh, my mom and my dad uh, both participated in that. Of course, all the family. Uh, it wasn't a, an option, uh, whatever, but mom would read the Bible one morning and dad would pray. And then the next morning, dad would read the Bible and mom would pray. And then when we got old enough that we could start reading the Bible, we each took turns reading the Bible and we looked ahead to see who was going to get stuck with Psalm 119. <laughs> But we had worship in the morning, every morning, every morning, every morning of our growing up years. And then we had our own individual worship in the evening. And again, you know, these things in our, in our early lives um, really impact us. Um, and, you know, throughout our life, Mom had her own uh, prayer life, and I'm sure Dad did too. But every day about 2 o'clock, if you went in the house... Um, when we were growing up, uh, if you were in the house or wherever, the door would be closed and she was in her room on her knees praying. And I know, you know, I heard my parents pray for me every day 
And I know that my, my mom prayed for me um, every day, and each of one of our kids and, and grandkids, uh, each one of us kids and our grandkids prayed every day because whenever I would go by the house, uh, even after, you know, we, we'd all left, every day at 2 o'clock, Mom would be in, that, in her room on her knees. And so I always tried to avoid that time of day. Um, anyway, there was, um, as I was growing up, you know, I say we have revivals, and uh, it was hard for me to sit still. Still is hard for me to sit still. And uh, so I had a couple of uh, 3D puzzles. They were plastic, and I'd take them apart and put them back together, and I'd daydream and this and that and the other. But I was hearing what was going on, and it was going in there. And we don't forget what we hear. And, you know, I, I, our church has children's church, and I hate it. Because our children, you know, I don't know what's going on in children's church. I hope they are receiving the word. But your, our children need to be in the sanctuary when the preaching's going on. Because they hear it, and they need to hear it. Uh, but but um, there was a guy, uh, one of the, he was named Reverend Comer. I don't know his first name. And uh, his, his job was an evangelist. And he would go from, you know, place to place to place. He wasn't a pastor. He was an evangelist. And uh, he told the best children's stories that you ever did hear. Um, and, and I, you know, longed to go back to revival so I could hear that children's story the next day. And I would say to us pastors, if you're not telling the children's story, you're missing such a vital part of teaching and of influencing our younger generation. You know, it gives them a sense of feeling that they are a part. And so it's their special time uh, set apart. So um, I was called to be super, uh, Sunday school superintendent before I was um, drive behind the ears, of course. Uh, maybe 13 or 14, I don't know, but reading has always been a difficult thing for me. Um, school was always a difficult thing for me. Um, but um, I, I got up there and I would read the scripture and I'd, read, I'd stammer over scripture and stammer over a devotional and my mom would encourage me and other people um, would also uh, encourage me and so forth. And so I, I, I guess that began uh, my speaking. I never really liked to get up in front of other people. It's still not one of my favorite things to do. Um, but it's part of God humbling us and keeping us where we're at, um, keeping us pliable or, or whatever. But I remember wanting to be an usher because I saw those young men um, serving. Uh, they weren't all young. Uh, but I, I aspired to, to be like the men of the church because they were leaders. And it wasn't that I wanted to be a leader. Um, matter of fact, you know, pastoring is not one of those things that I really desired to do. Um, but the Lord called me to uh, later. And, and throughout my life, I ended up being in leadership whether I wanted to or not. And, uh, but, but anyway, I, I saw in these guys something else. Uh, something that I desired to be. And uh, each of us should be those people in our churches that um, that pe other younger people, young, younger fellows and guys, uh, gals, need to aspire to be. And that was, they. I saw their faithfulness, I saw their spirituality, I saw their wisdom, I saw their diligence, and, and it spoke volumes to me. And I aspired to be that. And I think that our churches today are missing out on that because there are so many men that are not in church. And those of us that are really need to watch what we do and how we do. Uh, anyway, um, I think that, you know, um, our America really suffered when we went from the fields to the factory. Because a, a fella being around his father really molds that person. And, and a mother being around the daughter really molds that person. And I know I had a very unique um, childhood, praise the Lord, because 
you know, until I was about six, I guess it was, we lived in Woodstock, and, and Dad would commute back and forth to Morgantown, and then we built a house down there by the shop, and uh, Dad couldn't get away from work if he wanted to, uh, but, but I was around Dad all the time, and uh, there was, you know, um, he, he always had... I don't know, not always, but many times you go in there and there was Swindoll on the, on the radio or he had a cassette player and he was playing Swindoll or Dr. Dobson or J. Vernon McGee or um, what is the name, Brother F. I don't know his first name, but um, they were some old times. And, of course, again, I was hearing this. And my dad, um, you know, I, I looked at him and I, and I desired to have the wisdom that he had, and every now and then he dropped these wisdom bombs, and it's like, you know, that's really, that's really something. I need to think about that, you know. And and other observation, I saw how he, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I saw how he interacted with the public and other people. Um, you know, people would come in there. Uh, from the church, the pastor would come in there and they would talk and and I would be there um, when I was old enough to actually doing some good, you know, I'd be doing my job or whatever. When I wasn't young, old enough, um, I was uh, enjoying taking this hacksaw and making stuff out of wood. And uh, so I guess that's where I got my start. But um, at home, we always... Talk to, I don't know, I ain't gonna say we always talk, but we talk Bible a lot. And there, you know, whether it was in truth or in jest, you know, we talk Bible We would say, Thou shalt not. And, you know, there was many things you could finish that off with. Uh, or, you know, mom would try a new recipe, or somebody would say, Well, I'm gonna do this, and we'd be skeptical, or whatever, we'd say, Oh, ye a little faith. <laughs> you know, or. Or this one I always liked and caused me to shudder. Be sure your sins will find you out. And, and that's not just our sins, you know, but it's those things that, you know, maybe somebody made a mistake, an honest mistake that didn't matter to anybody, you know, but everybody saw it. It's like, be sure your sins will find you out. And things of that sort. Um, and one of, the, one of those things, you know, we have a tendency to pick on each other and so forth. Uh, we might say the bears are going to eat you up. <laughs> Second Kings 2, uh, Elisha. Um, anyway, if you want to look that up. But, but uh, most things at my house, uh, in my life with my parents, was either explained through the Bible or through the Bible characters or through the Bible uh, experiences and, and stories and so forth like that. So we are almost out of time. And I figured this was not going to go very well. Uh, anyway, there are some pivotal, and I'm not going to rush it because it's, I just ain't no way I can get it all in and a half. All right, some pivotal points in my faith and belief. Uh, John 20, 29. John 20, 29 says, Then Jesus told him, which he was talking to uh, Judas, I mean uh, Thomas, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. Um, Harold Ebersole was our um, youth director, and uh, Harold and Dee, and they would always take us on two camping trips a year, and that usually consisted of, because he was in the school system, and that usually consisted of Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And so we go over weekends that we could do that with. And uh, a lot of times we would, about every other time, we would go to Brother Woods because it was close and, and so forth. And uh, so we would have, in the, in the evening when we got there on Friday, evening, we'd have, um, it, it wasn't just a fun time, um, but it was a fun time because we'd have some kind of a uh, theme. And we'd have devotions. I, I'm not going to say devotion. I'm saying a lesson that um, Friday evening, Saturday twice, Sunday twice, and then Monday before we left, uh, we'd have a wrap-up type thing. And one of his instructions, one of uh, Harold's instructions, was that we go out into the, um, the woods or, or wherever, out into nature, and just sit and listen for God. 
Yes. All right. Yes. So everybody had done that. And then <clears throat> that evening, as we were gathered around, uh, there was um, talk about um, what, um, you know, what everybody saw, what God had talked to us about. And then one, one was very reluctant and said, I was sitting by the lake. And the wind blew, and they were reluctant. And it says, and the word God was on was on the lake. And another one goes, I saw that too. And someone else says, I did too. And and I hadn't chosen to be around the lake that morning. That morning, I had chosen to be out in the woods. And I thought, why didn't I see that? Why couldn't I see that? <laughs> And that really bothered me. It's like, why didn't you show me that, God? And God says, your faith is strong, Dale. You don't need to see. You, you know, it's like Thomas. Thomas had to see to believe. Brothers and sisters, we don't have to see. When you have true faith, you don't have to see because you know God works in our lives. Amen. And that, that was something that I had always that I had struggled with for, I don't know, a couple of days before he revealed that to me. And then that is something that has stuck with me all along. Look, God does show himself to us Amen. if we're looking. Amen. But not always in the way we think he will or expect him to. All right, at age 19, uh, I was asked to teach um, the youth group. Harold was retiring, so to speak. And I was asked to teach Ruth youth group. And you know, at age 19, at 19, you're still a youth. <laughs> and I was going to be teaching my girlfriend. Yeah, you know? And uh, kind of kind of ratcheted up. And so I didn't know, you know, this is the friend I'd never taught before, all right? And uh, I knew how Harold had taught and so forth. And it was a pretty tall order. And so I didn't know whether God really wanted me to do that or not. So um, let's look at the next scripture in Judges. No, let's, yeah, it is in Judges. Uh, Judges 6, 36 through 40. And this is probably going to be a very familiar scripture with it. But we started early, right? So we can go a little later. Gideon said to God, um, if you will say, uh, save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand. And you said... As you said, and that is what had happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. <clears throat> then Gideon said to God, and this is so precious, he says, do not be angry with me, Lord. Let me, let me just make one more request. Gideon wanted to make sure of God's call on his life. Allow me one more test. And, and I'm reading in here, okay? Allow me one more test, Lord, please. The time, this time, make the fleece dry and the ground covered with dew. And God says, not a problem. No. <laughs> <laughs> that night, God did so. Only if the fleece was dry, all the ground was covered with dew. <clears throat> So I, I, I was, as at my dad's shop, and that was, I was 19, I was old enough to be some good to him then and not get under his feet. And uh, I was working on deer heads, and I said, Lord, the, the time was coming, I had to give him an answer. I said, I don't know what to do. Uh, so I said, I'm going to lay me a fleece. I said, I was at the fire department at the time, and I said, Lord, if there is a fire this afternoon, I'll know that's what you want me to do. And about 10 minutes later, I thought, you know, Dale, that is really selfish. To wish somebody else's misfortune so that you can get an answer to a prayer. I said, just forget that, Lord. And I and I left it at that because I didn't know didn't know what kind of fleece to lay. And don't you know, about a half hour later, the fire alarm went off. I know you think this is stuff, this stuff don't happen, but it does, brothers and sisters. It does. Amen. All right, I was so so I about knocked dad over getting out of the shop. I had I didn't even think about it, didn't because I put it out of my mind. All right, and I'm going up the road. When I get to the Tasty Freeze, let's see, it's not the Tasty Freeze anymore. It's a uh, candy diner or something. Anyway, when I got there, false alarm, you can cancel. So 
I wanted to get credit for the call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got a brother that's in the fire department out there. And I wanted to get credit for the call, so I go over into the fire department, and you know, we're talking and everything. It's like, well, what was the false alarm? Well, they don't know. Well, what did dispatcher say? Well, dispatcher said he didn't know why it went off. <laughs> well, brothers, look, I promise you, I promise you, scriptures tell us not to swear. Okay, so I'm not gonna swear to it, but I promise you, it had never happened before, never happened as far as long as I was in the fire department again. And it still didn't dawn on me what was going on. All right, so we're talking there. It's like you're kidding. No, that's that's what it said. You don't know why it went off. It just went off. And so we talked a little bit, and I head back down the road. When I got to the tasty freeze, it hit me, and I called that evening. So okay. I'll teach you class. Jesus. All right. So we're going to leave that. And the next time <clears throat> I'm asked to free, uh, teach, uh, bring the devotions, um, we'll start there. Amen. Let us pray. Give him the glory. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity Amen. to be in your service. Lord, we thank you for calling us even before um, we knew you would love us and care for us even before we open our eyes. Lord, you are a great and gracious God. You desire that we be um, servants of yours. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to, to fulfill that desire in, in, in our Father's heart. And Lord, that we pray that we might be good servants, good children of yours and faithful. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the food that has been prepared for us, and Lord, we thank you for giving us appetites that we might enjoy it, and um, Lord, the hands that have prepared it, Lord, and, and their diligence in serving you through serving us, and Lord, we ask your blessings on them. Lord, we ask your blessings on this place and the establishment, Lord, uh, that we are able to come and have a place to gather together as brothers in Christ. And, so, Lord, as we partake of the food, we ask that you would uh, help it to do its duty and to strengthen us, and, Lord, that we might be able to um, carry on the work that you've called us to do. For us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.